these little guys hang out in eucalyptus trees to sleep 19 hours a day. They don't have to work much because they're surrounded by their only food, eucalyptus leaves. They eat so many of them, they smell like eucalyptus cough drops. And they're such adorable animals, they become the wildlife ambassadors for Australia, the only place they're found in the wild. I'm Jack Hanna, and these are Queensland koalas. Join us on Zoo Life to learn more about the animals of the world. One of the best things about zoos and nature parks is that they let you get close to the animals, seeing them as you never could in the wild. Here at the Australian Wildlife Park in Sydney, they take that concept to an extreme, encouraging you to get as close to the animals of Australia as possible. So close that even if you're not a zoo director like me, you can cuddle a koala or have your picture taken with one. Most of these animals are hand-raised, so they don't seem to mind the attention. In fact, they thrive on it. The Australian Wildlife Park has been tremendously successful in breeding Queensland koalas. Ever hear a koala in the mood for love? It's not an uncommon sound around here. Eleven koalas were born here last year alone. Our goal is to breed excess animals for our own needs, which we will then radio collar and release into areas where koalas once were, and to track them through the bush to make sure that they have adapted to their new life. And once we feel that they can be unleashed from mankind, we take off their little computerized collar and off they go. Now, I know they're a marsupial, which means the young are raised in the pouch. Mm -hmm. or just where is the pouch? That's a good question. Now, her pouch, yep. <laughs> she's got a good grip of you there. Just turn around, I'll take this branch. Okay, she's got your claws in her neck. That's okay. it there. The pouch is sitting right there. Right there's the pouch. Huh. And because she's immature, it's not very well developed. Now, the males have a very interesting thing. He has a scent gland. That's that dark patch in the middle of his chest there. And that scent gland is used to rub on the branches of the trees to mark out his territory. Their nose is so cute, it almost looks like a fake rubber nose. Yeah, it is. It's very sensitive to smell. He'll always smell the leaf before he eats it. Another very interesting thing, for climbing, they've adapted. They've got two thumbs. You can see him holding my thumb. Three fingers on this side. Two thumbs on that side. Their fur is so soft. Is it true they hunted the koala for its coat? Unfortunately, yes. Earlier this century, there were literally millions of these animals hunted for their skins. Today, they're totally protected, and you could end up in jail or paying a very heavy fine if you harmed a koala in any way. Well, I tell you, Terry, these animals are as cute as everybody says they are. They sure are. They are precious. The park offers a broad sampling of animals that are uniquely Australian. From creatures the continent is famous for, like kangaroos and dingoes, to lesser known but equally interesting animals, like the ant-eating echidna, the ostrich-like emu, and the common wombat, Australia's version of a prairie dog. Yeah, like like does, it's so nice. Common wombats are exceedingly alert to any new scent, which they'll tend to follow with great determination. And they can run it up to 20 miles per hour, which is a lot faster Whoops. than anyone in our crew. Whoa, easy guy. Whoa. Fortunately, wombats are not good at jumping. The Australian Wildlife Park has 15 flying foxes on display. Also called fruit bats, flying foxes are quite common in Sydney. They are a very interesting group of animals. For many years we thought they were closely related to primates, but recently this has been disproven. We're not quite sure where they actually come from. Known also as fruit bats, 
These sociable creatures come from tropical and semi-tropical areas and live in colonies that sometimes number a million or more. Tell me about their diet. What are we feeding them? We're feeding them here a mixture of fruits, so it's like a big fruit salad. Uh, things like papayas and cantaloupes, and even stone fruit. It looks like they've got little hands or claws on their wings. They sure do. It's just like our hand, but it's elongated and there's a lot of webbing in there. See the thumb here? That's like a thumb and they use that to grab onto each other. I've heard that some people eat these. They do, yeah. Um, unfortunately, in certain parts of the world, particularly in the South Pacific, these animals are considered a delicacy. Terry, just what is their role in the wild? Believe it or not, these animals are responsible for the seeding of the rainforest. The health of the rainforest relies on flying foxes. They eat the fruit, they don't digest the seed. So they defecate and the seed then grows into more trees. So the health of a rainforest relies on these guys. The Australian Wildlife Park also displays a sampling of the scalier side of the continent's wildlife. Guanas are the down-under equivalent of monitor lizards. They're found in the more arid parts of the outback, where they prey on reptiles and small mammals. The frill-necked lizard, also known as the frilled dragon, comes from tropical northern Australia. But the most impressive reptile here is a prime example of the largest reptile species on Earth, the saltwater crocodile. At 16 feet and 1,700 pounds, Maniac, as they call him, is slightly overweight even for a growing young crocodile. So keepers here exercise him. We do that with a long pole, and we call it our maniac aquarobics. We splash with the pole on the uh, water surface. He fills that through pressure gauges along his jaw and comes up looking for something to grab at. And by provoking him to strike several times and to turn in the water, which is something he wouldn't normally do without a reason, we're actually burning off a lot of that fat. Saltwater crocodiles become so rare in the wild that the Australian government forbids killing or harming them. But the crocodile in this exhibit seems to protect itself just fine. What are you doing there now? Well, I'm going to throw this chicken to him, and we're going to see if he'll uh, right, let's react try as he would to a large animal. Good one this time. He should feel the resistance yeah, of the rope. Is that pretty strong? Yeah, it's very Good strong. On. Can we pull him out of the water? Uh, uh, I wouldn't advise getting him too close. <laughs> now, this... this, this I'm so nervous I can't talk. Could he eat somebody as big as you or me? Oh, yes, yeah. He'd shake your arms and legs off, but he'd eat the main part of our torso and head. <laughs> Is the crocodile, does it kill people in Australia? Oh, yes. Yeah, we've had 13 known deaths in the last few years. And, of course, in uh, Arnhem Land, where the Aboriginals live, we have no record of how many have eaten. There could be a lot more. Well, yes. well he is powerful. Oh, 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 oh. You're right, Jack. Huh? Don't sit down on the job when I've finished. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. Now, if he was to out, could he outrun us up here? He could throw his length out of the water if his head was back where it was before, quicker than you and I could probably react to move away. But he couldn't outrun us over distance. Is that the size of the crocodile, the crocodile Dundee? Uh, yeah, that'll be about the same size. Most of the ones that kill people are around five metres. Well, good day, mate. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Australia is an island continent with more than 20,000 miles of coastline. Almost all of the country's population lives along these coasts. So it's easy to understand why the people here are so fascinated with sea life. When the people in Sydney want to get a closer look at life underwater, they come right here to the Manly Ocean Area. Let's go take a look. Most of the oceanarium is devoted to a gigantic donut-shaped display that swarms with sea life. Built around a circular acrylic tunnel more than 100 yards in circumference, the exhibit is designed for the benefit of both fish and fish fans. The general idea is to immerse humans in the world of offshore Australia, and boy is it teeming with life. There's practically an entire food chain at your fingertips here, from major predators to tiny reef fish. Visitors often wonder why the bigger fish don't eat the smaller ones. The truth of the matter is that sometimes they do. But aquarists here are able to keep predation to a minimum by feeding the larger fish frequently. And to make sure that everyone gets a fair share, they do it by hand. We don't feed the same type of fish all the time, simply because they don't eat the same type of fish all the time in the wild. It would be like if someone gave us pizzas every day of the week. Uh, we'd soon get sick of pizzas. Some of the larger rays are even fussier than the sharks. They'll take handouts, but like the rest of us, they'd rather have their fish fresh. 
they actually go and smother their prey. So I'll swim over the top of it and parachute down on top of it so that the fish is stuck underneath their, underneath their body mass. And then they'll just wiggle around on their body mass until eventually the fish gets up around their mouth and they'll, they'll bite it. They have very powerful crushing jaws. They don't have sharp teeth like sharks. And they'll just crush it to pieces and eat it. With all this feeding going on, I wondered what was keeping the divers from being eaten. We're always led to believe that sharks are these really hungry animals roaming around the oceans just looking for food all the time. That's not necessarily true. Uh, when they need food, they'll, they'll take it. But they're so uh, perfectly designed for their environment, they require very little energy to drive them through the water. These are great nurse sharks. Ian Gordon has been studying the species for the past 10 years, both in the oceanarium and off the coast where their populations have been decimated by shark hunters. They live in an area where it's fairly shallow, so divers can access it very easily. And they hover above the bottom uh, in what we call gutters, which are like gullies uh, in the ocean, where the current races through. So it's very easy for a diver to just swim straight up and hit them in the head with a power stick or a bank stick, and, uh, and the shark's dead. The Australian government outlawed the killing of green nurse sharks in 1984. Ian hopes the ban will enable wild populations to recover. There is so little we know about sharks that it's very important that people like myself and, and uh, other, other scientists around the world work very hard on trying to learn as much as we can about these animals. If we don't, we could lose the animals before we really find out how important they actually are in the food chain. Where's that head? Look at that head. Look at that over there. Look at that head up. Pretty big, huh? She's really the size. Close it. Close it. Pull that head right to the box. That's it. Right, okay. So just hold it here, okay? She can't go anywhere now. Now, Ian, how did you get in here? We, uh, we noticed her some anaesthetic. And, uh, so she's a bit sleep now. She's a bit like Valium. So she's a little bit, a little bit groggy right at this very moment. Now, what are you getting ready to do with her? Well, we're going to weigh her right now. Why do you bring them in here? Okay, we have to check them out about every year. Uh, just so we can see what sort of growth rates, uh, they're getting. And this is a nurse shark. This is a gray nurse shark, yeah. It's a female. Uh, okay, ready? Left. Uh, okay. I don't know what she has. Yeah, about well, 53. Now, do you, do you check its teeth? Oh, oh, damn. Uh, we'll have a quick look at the teeth while we're out here once we're going for it. <laughs> Just want to watch the teeth. This is a body bit. <laughs> business end. The business end. Funnily enough, you're the one closest to the business end. <laughs> we're going to measure it. Okay, yeah, just tie a knot with him. He has those teeth. Yeah, it's a good set of wow. teeth, right? We. Uh, these guys drop teeth on a very regular basis, so we don't really have to worry about holes in their teeth, but uh, we still have a quick look anyway, just to make sure. Well, this is the closest I've been to a shark's mouth. <laughs> yeah, as close as you want to become, too, I'd say. Now, why do you keep her on her back? Well, when we keep them on their back, it tends to disorient them. And uh, while we're disoriented, it just helps to uh, calm them down a bit. As soon as I roll her over, she's going to start kicking almost immediately. Right, I'll let you go ahead and roll her over. Now, Paul, can you keep a hold of that tail? Okay, drop it in away. If given the choice, often I'd, I'd spend time with sharks and humans. <laughs> So I think, to a degree, uh, sharks aren't nicer than what we think. But I must stress, they are potentially dangerous animals as well. And they're not like teddy bears.